Good evening. This is The Daily Drum for Wednesday, April 17th. Here's what's happening. Baltimore police make an arrest in the cold case murder of a D.C. police officer. 40-year-old Sergeant Tony Mason Jr. was shot to death in West Baltimore back in 2017. He was off-duty, not in uniform, and sitting in a car with his girlfriend. Investigators believe Dion Thompson, who was 18 at the time and a known drug dealer, was suspicious of the people in the car and shot them. D.C. Police Chief Pamela Smith credited Baltimore authorities for not giving up on the case. The details surrounding Sergeant Mason's tragic death have remained a painful mystery. But the Baltimore Police Department, the FBI, the ATF, and the Baltimore City State's Attorney's Office never stopped following up on tips and tracking down leads. The shooting, Thompson is serving federal time on unrelated gun and drug charges. Well, making sure your children get home from school safely, Prince George's County has launched a pilot safe passage program this week. Adult volunteers are asked to walk students from school to prevent fighting, bullying, and other safety concerns. Suitland, Largo, Central, Bladensburg, and Flowers High Schools and Andrew Jackson Middle School are part of the pilot program. Montgomery County police are looking for more possible victims of sexual assault after the arrest of a rape suspect last Friday. They are circulating the photo of 46 year old Charles Irby Jr. He's suspected of assaulting a girl in Aspen Hill on April 10th. The girl told police Irby made her feel uneasy after speaking to her on a Metro bus. She got off the 13, got off in the 13,000 block of Veers Mill Road. Irby allegedly followed her, coaxed her into nearby woods and assaulted her. Another credit card skimmer has been discovered at a D.C. store. The device was found last night at the 711 and the 3300 block of Connecticut Avenue Northwest. Police don't know if it is tied to the discovery of five other skimmers at D.C. grocery stores since March 25th. Detectives have identified suspects tied to the older cases. And the Democratic-controlled Senate quickly dismissed the impeachment charges against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas today. The Senate voted along party lines, ruling both impeachment articles unconstitutional because they did not rise to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors. The move by the upper chamber caps a months-long effort by Republicans to oust Mayorkas over his handling of the U.S.-Mexico border. Let's take a quick look at our weather now. Tonight, cloudy with lows in the upper 50s to lower 60s. Tomorrow, sunny with highs near 80. We're coming up, cracking down on juvenile crime, protecting election workers, the Trump hush money case, and a whole lot more. Join us at the Reporters' Roundtable for some of the top stories of the week. Insight is next on WHUR and WHUT-TV. On the go and on demand, WHUR and WHUT are with you. Download the WHUR app today to get full access to shows, playlists, and our latest contests. To access WHUT on demand, download the PBS app and make Howard University Television your station. Catch up on our WHUT original productions anytime, anyplace on YouTube at WHUT-TV. WHUR and WHUT, better together. D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, you might have noticed something a little different on Monday nights at 8 p.m. I'm Angie Ange, our director of content here at WHUT. And Monday nights at 8 p.m., we like to call it Must See DMV. All your favorite shows from all your favorite creators focus solely on what makes D.C., Maryland, and Virginia so special. So set your clock, and we'll catch you at 8 p.m. right here on WHUT, Howard University Television, telling your stories on your station. Welcome back to The Daily Drum on WHUR, WHUT-TV, and Sirius XM Channel 141. I'm Harold Fisher. This is the Insight segment. We are at the Reporters' Roundtable with a look at some of the top stories of the week. And as always, we've got some doozies for you to talk about. My guests are Reese Colbert, founder of Black Women Views Media, and she is also a Sirius XM host. And, of course, Sam P.K. Collins with The Washington Informer. On deck tonight... Prince George's County introduces more bills to crack down on juvenile crime. D.C. and Maryland lead the nation 
in vehicle theft, so check your cars outside. There are new laws in Maryland to protect election workers. Things are moving at the Key Bridge collapse site in Baltimore. Jury selection continues in the Donald Trump hush money trial. Dr. Frederick Haynes resigns as president and CEO of the Rainbow Push Coalition three months after taking the job. And Atlantic City's mayor and his wife are accused of abusing and assaulting their teenage daughter. We have a lot to talk about. Sam, Reese, thank you so much for joining the conversation. Thank you for having me. Peace and blessings. All right, so let's first talk about what's happening in Prince George's County. Just this week, Council Member Edward Burroughs introduced a bill to help crack down on juvenile crime. This is what he had to say about that. There's no reason to have a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old um, without a chaperone at 2, 3 a.m. Um, on a school night. This curfew bill, and I'll start with you, Reese, is highly specific because it involves business zones mm -hmm. where young people are known to, to congregate. Uh, your, your, your thoughts about that? You, know, you remember Prince George's had a, a curfew for young people last year, and from all accounts, it was successful. Right. Well, I mean, and that curfew still applies. What this is trying to do is trying to allow businesses to implement an even earlier curfew, um, as early as 5 p.m., uh, but, and you can go as late as 5 a.m. That's what this bill is amending the curfew rules for. I think that the problem with curfews isn't necessarily just the fact that um, we don't have enough of them. It's the enforcement around it, as well as the fact that a lot of kids are unattended because they don't have anything better to do. And in this economy, you have to recognize that there are a lot of economic reasons for why some parents cannot necessarily uh, afford to have somebody watch their kids, put them in other programs, or even people working multiple jobs may not be able to tend to their children, which is their responsibility, but it's not necessarily a dereliction, it's a necessity for them. So I think that there are a number of things that have to be addressed here in addition to just slapping another round of curfews on teenagers. Your thoughts about it, Sam? Yeah, I, I would like to see what other pieces of legislation or initiatives are going to support this curfew just to sort of mitigate what Reese talked about as far as the economic factors that are at play because young people are going to be young people. If their parents aren't there, you have to think about uh, the family dynamics these days. You know, you have extended families or lacks thereof. You have parents working, you know, so forth and so on. So what is PG County and any other jurisdiction doing to first mitigate those factors and second of all, uh, ensure that young people have what they need once they are put at home? Because there are things beyond, you know, our control or that can be within our control that we have to, you know, once again, take into account. Well, Burroughs did say yesterday that he was getting overrun Mm -hmm. with complaints from business owners yeah. and managers. And he said he would prefer to invest in, as you just said, Sam, resources for, for young people that would help support them recreationally. He even mentioned, you know, I want, I want these young people to have something fun to do. Yeah. But the reality is um, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Mm -hmm. And we are talking about uh, business owners and, and managers and the like. And if it becomes an issue of, of economics, mm -hmm. then at some point, boroughs and other council members are probably saying, you know, we've got to make sure that our businesses are healthy yeah. and, and safe. And that's a valid, that's a completely valid concern. I mean, at the end of the day, we as residents want to have businesses where we are, as opposed to having to drive extra 15, 20 minutes because people are closing up shop due to theft or a number of things. But I think what you said really hits the key, the nail on the head, which is, do they have what they need at home? And 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 what you said is about the squeaky squeaky wheel gets the there you the go <laughs> i always mess that up i always throw the mouth of the mouse and the cheese in there but um i don't know why but but to your point people show up 
to say we need more policing because there's crime. People show up to say that we need curfews, but they don't show up to when the discussions are happening around recreational spending, around after school programs. I know my husband, for instance, he serves in at, at, the, at the local level and he has been on calls with the county about budget priorities, trying to plug holes. And there is very little engagement from the broader community in those calls that's when the decisions are being made about where the money is being invested and the resources are being invested, not after the fact. Now we're playing defense, trying to plug a hole with uh, trying to stop crime. And so, as you pointed out, everybody has to be equally engaged um, if they want to see those investments in preventative measures as opposed to just more policing or more laws being passed. And you have to remember that this particular bill, which is a county bill, is not operating in a vacuum. Right. We saw what happened with the Maryland State uh, General Assembly this year, where the headline and the overarching concern was about juvenile crime, mm -hmm. juvenile justice, right. and and I think, and I've said this on this this program any number of times the the voters have been very loud and clear when you have people who are sick and tired of being sick and tired mm -hmm. and and even those parents who you know who are doing the best they can to raise to raise their children properly properly yeah we were all kids once. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Um, I know it's hard. I was a good at two shoes. Yeah, where are you now? I was. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to Google that. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> I, I, I got some thoughts on this matter. Sure. And, you know, the same thing's happening in D.C. Yes. Where time and time again during budget season, we always pit economics versus extracurriculars and supports for young people and time and time again the businesses end up winning because we're talking about economic development economic development you know forgetting to understand that young people are also a part of that if you're not investing in them then they won't be able to enjoy the city or the jurisdiction where the activity is happening mm -hmm. and you won't have a workforce that is um, able to participate in the economy so what is the county doing as far as that? And in regards to how people feel and, you know, the whole hoopla around youth violence, not to disregard that, but oftentimes, you know, we get caught up in the here and now, forgetting that in the 90s and in the 2000s, we did this thing again, time and time again, and it failed. And people are just not willing to pay attention to evidence-based solutions, and especially politicians, because we have politicians working within that four-year or two-year, however long their term is, vacuum. Mm -hmm. They're thinking about the next election. And you know, during election season, you know, during their term, they only have, out of that four years, maybe like two years where they really get to do what they want. But the rest of the time, they're trying to get reelected. It's that lame duck exactly. kind of, mm -hmm. of, of point. And, and, and you make a good point. But here's the other thing, and I know we're talking about the curfew, but one of the other things that also came out of yesterday's Prince George's County Council meeting was Council Member Crystal Oriata also introduced a bill um, making it uh, more difficult for for young people to to possess ghost guns mm -hmm. and you know we've got curfews over here yeah which basically say you young people you need to stay home mm -hmm. but she is addressing uh an even more serious mm -hmm. and in some cases deadly uh issue about about ghost guns and juvenile crime. That, that That is not about staying home after midnight. Yeah. That That is about, you know, more broadly, we're, we're talking about violent crime. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we already are one of the most carceral countries in the world, right? And then you, that applies at the state level, at the local level. And so, I don't think that we have a lack of laws. I don't think mm -hmm. that we have a lack of <clears throat> law enforcement, um, especially as it relates to gun. I think that there is too much opportunity 
for people to get access to these guns. And so I think that often we target the individual instead of targeting the system around how these guns are proliferating, how these, how these circumstances are, are becoming more rampant. And so I don't take issue with, 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 with more severe consequences. Um, but again, they are not the ones who are creating and manufacturing these things. Somehow there's a pipeline and it ends with them. Mm -hmm. We need to tackle the pipeline because they have no capacity to be the pipeline themselves. They're just the recipients. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and, no, go ahead. No, I, I would even go as far as, you know, just to back up on that point, um, especially when it comes to ghost guns. Ghost guns, there's a lot of opportunity with that. My understanding is that about 20% of the pieces you can order online and the other 80% you print out. So what are we doing federally to stop all of that? And I know at the local level in DC, for example, there's some conversation around that, but what are we doing federally to um, stop the production of ghost guns, to stop, to, to, to pretty much regulate that? That's the question, you know, and, you know, frankly, again, going back to my point about businesses versus people, when it comes to economics, the people, the downtrodden, the youth, they always catch the short end of the stick. I think I said that right. They always do, mm -hmm. you know, because in the here and now, they're just not seen as profitable. And that has to stop. Can I, can I just say Please, one more point about that? The pieces. We live in a society now where when you go into a CVS or a Target and you want to get cold medicine, somebody has to take it out of a lockbox. You have to show an ID. Mm -hmm. And yet you can get parts to assemble a gun online with no oversight. So that's where I'm talking about the pipeline. And, and if, you can, if you can regulate people's access to cold medicine or sinus medicine, then you can find a way to regulate these guns. You would, I would push back on that. I would say you, you would want to. Yeah, you would want to. But, and we had this conversation as a sidebar on this program last week when when you look at gun culture mm -hmm. in this country and, and and i said it then and i i'll, I'll say it again you know, i'm not a gun person yeah you know i i i see you know guns for you know for those who, who own them like you know families down south mm -hmm. who, who had farms yeah. you know you had a shotgun or you had a you know, a, a, a rifle for, for hunting. I understand that people have, you know, handguns for, for self-defense of their home. But there is an element in this country, uh, you can say fueled by the NRA or other kinds of groups where, and we've heard this before, every political season, we have, there are people in this country who love their guns. Yeah. They absolutely do. And, that, and, and I think there's a difference between people who may see them as, as tools in self-defense. Mm -hmm. Those are the folks that would probably agree with you about you know, the whole ghost gun thing. But then you have a, a significant uh, and powerful voting public that are part of a, a more intense gun culture. And, and that's that's my pushback. I'm not saying that it shouldn't happen. Yeah. I don't think it can. Mm. You know, to your point, that just comes from this idea of individualism in American society because, you know, those of us who call ourselves Americans, we always want to express our rights and have the freedom to do what we want. And that has consequences. And, you know, not to mention that America... Uh, is not a melting pot necessarily, more like a salad bowl. Mm. So you have different groups, different interests. That sense of community is not there. So people are always putting their priorities and their protection over that of other people with deadly consequences. And, you know, you saw this in the 1990s where well, the more conservative racist elements of the American society, they went into... Um, the background, your Timothy McVeigh's and whoever else, mm -hmm. and they racked up on their guns as well. You know, it's always that gun culture there, and it comes from individualism and protecting oneself. And, you know, one very important note to make, um, the NRA, as a lobby, 
And you have to throw race into the mix because the gun conversation, it gets racialized. You know, when it comes to uh, African-Americans, black people living in urban communities, you know, they want to regulate how we operate with guns. Mm -hmm. You know, not keeping in mind that, just like you said, in the South, our families had guns and we used them, you know, quite maturely. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to, you know, other races of people, particularly white people, um, that individualism comes with control. You know, it's a sense of control, a sense of, I would even go as far to say, you know, domestic terrorism, just, you know, ensuring that they can perpetuate a system that keeps them on top. So all of that, you know, goes into account. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's what, the, that's what the NRA came out of. And I think, you know, to your point, that's pretty much why we won't see any sensible gun legislation being enacted anytime soon. I want to, be, before we go to the break, I have a, a few minutes. I want to start this. We may have to pick it up on the other side. That according to the National Insurance Crime Bureau, D.C. and Maryland, lead the way when it comes to stolen vehicles in 2023. Yeah. That is mind-blowing. Connecticut is number three, but D.C. had an increase of 64%. Maryland, an increase of 63%. And it, that, and that kind of goes along, obviously, with the issue that we are discussing, yeah. whether it's Juvenile crime, uh, carjacking and guns, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the like. Uh, Hyundai and Kia vehicles, the number one. And we've also seen, and I'll start with you, Sam, we, we've seen efforts, particularly in the District of Columbia, for, you know, upgrading, you know, getting the free upgrades and all of these other things, you know, to keep people from having their vehicles stolen. And it's not stopping anytime soon, unfortunately, you know, even with some gains. Um, what I see is something a bit deeper than what those initiatives can solve. Uh, young people, they are mixing reality and fantasy. Mm. And that comes with just being in a social media era where it's less so about putting food on the table or you know, bridging that economic gap and more so about just um, showing off because the level of criminality these days is not even underground or it's not even, you know, it's very careless. They, they're going to live stream it. They're going to put themselves out there, you know, in this, in this surveillance state and they always get caught up because of that. So we got to, you know, get to the very root of that issue. What is it that is causing young people to show out in this way that, that they want to be seen, even when it comes to doing the most heinous of things. If we, once we get to the root of that, then we'll get to the root of this problem because it's much deeper than property. And that's another thing. Once again, that's the reoccurring theme for tonight, property over people. Once you start getting into the psychology of why people are doing these things, then you'll definitely change the course. Well, I, but I, I would also say that, that while, while there may be a a not insignificant percentage of young people who may be stealing cars for joy rides, as we know, and the, the reporting over the past several years has really uh, uh, borne this out, is that these vehicles are being stolen so that they can be used in other crimes, mm -hmm. you know, drive-by shootings. And these, and these young people are stealing these vehicles um, and turning them over to, to older, more mature criminal uh, entities mm -hmm. and and of course the younger people who are doing this and this has also been kind of that 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 narrative mm -hmm. where if they're under a certain age they won't go to jail and yeah. and so that's that's something else that we need to take into consideration listen I need to take a break but don't forget you can hear every edition of the Daily, Dr Daily Drum Insight segment via podcast on WHUR.com, and you can download the 96.3 HD2 app on your smartphone and hear the program live in its entirety. The Daily Drum will continue on Sirius XM Channel 141 and WHUT-TV in just a bit. I'm Harold Fisher. John Mons is next with the original Quiet Storm. That's on WHUR. We'll be back in just a bit. WHUT is dedicating weekdays at 10.30 a.m. 
to bring you the best of our locally produced series, like our arts and artists show, Artico, our energetic music series, DMV The Beat. Get out. When I wrote that song, we were fighting. And stories highlighting the endurance of the human spirit with legacy. He used to say to me all the time, when, I'm, when I die, the newspaper is yours. So remember, tune in weekdays at 10.30 a.m. Howard University Television PBS and WHUR 96.3 are joining forces Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. as we bring you Harold Fisher and the Daily Drum live as we take you inside the stories of the DMV. We've got the experts and the people that matter most to help you make informed decisions for your family and your community. That's the Daily Drum Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. live on WHUT and WHUR. Better together. Welcome back to The Daily Drum on WHUT TV and Sirius XM Channel 141. I'm Harold Fisher. We are at the Reporters Roundtable with some of the top stories of the week. My guests are Reese Colbert, founder of Black Women Views Media. She's also a Sirius XM host. And Sam P.K. Collins with the Washington Informer. I want to go to another a story, this one coming out of Annapolis. And this is one of the, the stories that is really disturbing, you know, to me that there are new laws on the books that increase penalties for threats against election workers. And it has increased from 1,000 to 2,500 uh, and, and that also includes perhaps three years in prison for anyone who issues a threat against an election judge. Three years in prison. Reese, that is where we are. This is not a Maryland thing. This is really a, a, a national story. And, and for all the talk that we have heard about secure elections, mm -hmm. can we talk a little bit about safe yeah. elections? Absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I like that Governor Moore and the Democrats in Maryland are being proactive about election integrity, meaning protecting the, the, the process for those who volunteer or get paid very little to actually administer our elections. Um, a lot of those people are people like my mother-in-law who works the polls every, every election cycle. People like Ruby uh, Johnson, Ruby Freeman, and, and Shea Moss, mm -hmm. who were slandered and their lives were turned upside down because of Rudy Giuliani and the lies that they pushed in Georgia that became a national story about so-called election fraud down there. And so I like the message that this is sending, do not try that crap over here in Maryland. You will go to jail. And I think it's very necessary. I'm, I, like I said, it's proactive. And it's proactive in a way that actually preserves our elections as opposed to what Republicans have been doing around the country, which is doing things like making it illegal to give people a, a water in line, uh, making it easier to uh, disenfranchise people with, with, with broad challenges to, to, to ballots and things of that nature. And so this is a good thing in terms of being making sure that this is a non-issue come election day. Hopefully it will be. Um, but it is obviously a sad state of affairs that we're in that this has to even be taken at this point. Sad. It, it is very indicative of where we've been over the last four years, and I would even go back further to say at least eight, just in terms of the polarization of the two parties in particular, and just how people will go to any means to secure a victory in an election. And you have to make sure that, you know, first, people are safe and that voting rights are protected and that people are protected when they go to the ballot box. So, you know, kudos to Maryland for doing what they have to do as far as just uh, protecting the ballot box and protecting the people. Um, I'm not necessarily worried about the penalties. I do see the necessity of it. My concern is more so around the interpretation of the law, what qualifies as a threat against a poll worker, and whether the prosecutor would look at the mitigating circumstances of particular cases, not to take away from the intent of the law, mm -hmm. but I know that the intent and outcome oftentimes don't align. But other than that, the spirit of the law, I totally understand 
especially considering um, where we are currently in this day and age. I, I agree with you 100%, because if you are a person who likes to go to your polling place and you want to, and you vote, okay, and I'm trying to think, has there ever been a circumstance in all of the years that I have voted where I had an issue with a, with a poll worker or an election judge? And in my interaction with them, whether it's and I, and I voted in a lot of, of states because I, I've lived all over the country. Baltimore, mm -hmm. the District of Columbia, Huntsville, Alabama, mm -hmm. Tallahassee, Florida, Columbus, Ohio, Buffalo, New York, I have vo Kansas City, Missouri. I have voted in all of these places and I voted in person. Never once did I have a reason to do anything other than to say good morning and yeah. have and have a nice day. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, but this legislation, and obviously what you mentioned as it relates to what what happened in in Georgia, it, it as I said, this is this is really where where we are, mm -hmm. and I and I can remember years ago. And I think this was probably, uh, whether it was 2016 or it could have been 20, uh, even in the 2020 election season, that there were reports of armed people mm -hmm. who took it upon themselves to watch the, the mailing boxes, yep. for example. Why are you here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, you know and, and that's not about election work. The boxes just kind of sit, you know, wherever. But now, uh, you know, it, it it does. It really gives me pause. Who are the people who were possibly threatening the judges? Because as we know, and here in Maryland, you have a Democratic judge, you have a Republican exactly. judge, and these people are fulfilling their their civic duties. Yeah. Yeah. Why would you fuss with these people? Why would you threaten these people? <laughs> Just vote and get out. Yeah, literally. Well, I mean, I've had nothing but very pleasant exchanges in voting in all of the years and many states that, as you mentioned, I voted in several states as well. And so the election workers don't give you any reason to have any smoke with them, basically. Um, I think whenever anything that involves the law comes into play, we always have to take the consideration how laws are often weaponized against black people, how they disproportionately apply to us. But this is a law that's already been on the books. It's stiffening the penalties. Mm -hmm. And so if we haven't seen a history of abuse of this law weaponized against black people, I, I don't have that being a new concern. I have the concern about the kinds of rhetoric we've heard from Republicans around the country, the kind of actions we saw in 2020 in other states, not so much in Maryland, but in other states, and in the disinformation about elections being stolen. And so if these folks want to get what they call proactive, these J6 type of people out there, and I know a lot of them came from Maryland because DC is right there, then we have to be proactive in protecting our election workers as well. So I think that this is a net positive. Any potential drawbacks that I can even conceive of, I think we have enough evidence behind us to say that that probably wouldn't be an issue. You're not fussing with anybody at the polling places, are you saying? No, I got no reason to. I'm cool. <laughs> I'm cool. And I just get in, get out. Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. You know, go, go, go on about your business. I, I, I do want to move on to uh, what has... Which is, which is not just the story of the week, but could be one of the biggest stories of the year. Once again, we are updating you on the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse. And Maryland Governor Westmore has been doing almost daily updates. And this is what he had to say yesterday about the progress that they've been, ma they've been making. While we are excited to report this kind of momentum, that you've seen here, the thing we also know is this. The road ahead is still long. There are still many lifts. 
yesterday was was a good day for a bad situation. Mm -hmm. He announced some 1110 tons of the bridge uh, have been removed. Uh, sadly, they were able to recover the fourth uh, worker who perished during the course of the collapse. They were op able to open up another area for recreational uh, shipping mm -hmm. to get by. And the governor said it looks like they are on task for the small barges by the end of this month and the full uh, the and, and the full uh, Patapsco to be to be open by the end of May, but they 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 still will not have finished. Right. So you know, Sam, I, I, and I'll start with you. Are you surprised that things have moved so quickly? Yesterday was was three weeks since the collapse. Are you surprised that things have moved as quickly as they have? I'm not. Uh, um, and even though it's moved quickly, I think we still have a long way to go. Oh, yeah. Um, there's definitely a question of funding the reconstruction of the bridge eventually. And my understanding is there'll be some federal infusion of dollars for that endeavor. But as far as being surprised, I'm not. Um, at all. That was a very tragic situation. That bridge is very key as far as moving people, you know, throughout that area. And I know right now this compels some sort of conversation around safety, around infrastructure, um, you know, definitely around investments, around infrastructure. I know that, you know, if you are adverse to people spreading misinformation on social media, I suggest you stay away because there was a lot of people who don't know about science just talking the day that bridge collapsed. But it does call into question uh, what new technologies we can incorporate to better support the new structure, you know, just given what happened. But I'm not surprised at all. I think that um, both Governor Westmore uh, and um, the Baltimore mayor, you know, they jumped into action. They really instilled confidence into the people. And this is what uh, heads of state or executives should do in these mm -hmm. times. So. Your, your, thought about, your thoughts about where they are right now. Yeah, I think it shows when you have uh, effective local, state, and federal coordination. You know, you have Secretary Buttigieg, you have President Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris that have been very supportive of this. The Republicans in Congress, not so much. However, the executive branch, thankfully, is, are they're the ones who would do all this coordination with Governor Moore and Mayor Brandon Scott. And so I think it goes to show when government works properly. Um, they were not the cause of this crisis, but yet they have sprung into action and they have galvanized the resources. I would add, not just to infrastructurally get the, get the ball ro moving again, but Governor Moore has made sure that he made it so that people can get unemployment relief, so that the workers are being supported. Um, they're doing more in terms of routing traffic. And so I think that this, and, and being a tragic situation, has been handled as well as it possibly can be. And I think that's a testament to when you are looking at your elected officials and you want to see what are the receipts as opposed to what is the rhetoric. This is a prime example mm. of when it's done right. One of the things that came out yesterday, and I expect to see Governor Moore back on Capitol Hill, uh, if not this week, next week, to talk about funding a new bridge. Mm -hmm. And he's really trying to get ahead of that. Uh, President Biden has been dead set on making sure that the federal government pays for it all. We don't have a figure. We're not, we know it could be billions and billions of, of, of dollars. I mean, the bridge was, it was humongous. But one of the things that the governor has said, and it appears, and we can talk, and, and I'm talking about the politics. Yep. It appears that so far so good that the Maryland's congressional delegation, mm -hmm. Senate, and its House members are are sticking together. Uh, even you know Andy Harris, who is Republican, very very far right, uh, seems to have you know you know forgotten his partisan politics. Yeah. 
and says this is a Maryland problem. The governor has said this is a Maryland problem. Uh, members of the House, Senate, they've all said it's a Maryland problem. And so far... I think you mean national problem. Th thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. A, a, national, a national problem. Mm -hmm. And there may be parts of the country that aren't feeling it yet, yeah. but I suspect they will. Absolutely. Well, I, I, I listen, to your point about politics, I don't think that there's a more talented politician in the country right now than Governor Russ Moore. Mm. I've seen him in action. Um, he really does the people side of the politics very well. And so, yes, uh, Republicans can be quite the bit of obstruct obstructionist, but I do think that he can pick off enough people with the charm campaign. You shouldn't have to do that because there is obviously a very compelling economic reason and infrastructure reason to get the bridge up and moving. But I do think that to the extent that that kind of politicking is necessary, I think that Governor Moore is the perfect person to get that across. Charm offensive uh, working, you think, Sam? I think it works to some degree. You have to sort of, it's a game of give and take, you know, um, not give and take in the sense that you're compromising, but more so that you're working within the bounds of the system to get what you need. And um, Governor Westmore um, is doing that, and I think that's a testament to his private sector experience as well as you know his service over the course of his professional career. So definitely a lot to look forward to. Um, it is a national issue because once again, looking at infrastructure and you know. During an election season, if you want to go more broadly, people are going to be asking about what are we doing as a country as it relates to funding infrastructure versus um, foreign policy decisions that the executive or the Republican legislature might find more um, beneficial to their ends. Can I, can I just add one thing on that? Because even the Republicans that voted against the Infrastructure Act are still showing up at ribbon cuttings. <laughs> so infrastructure is one of those things that you cannot bet against if you want to have a political future. They've been able to get away with it on many occasions and they've been called out, but this is a generally popular thing to do is to back up infrastructure. And, and absolutely, and I think to the point about uh, Governor Moore, the thing that he does well that so many politicians often struggle with is making things make sense. Mm. And I'm not talking about dumbing it down. Yeah. This, is, this is easy to understand. Uh, a ship hit a bridge, we are in trouble. Mm -hmm. But with all of the moving pieces and the complications of this, I mean, suffice it to say, this has, this has to be one of the biggest uh, undertakings yeah. uh, in, in the nation right now. And for him to go on the air and to be able to, to make it make sense and be able to pull all of these pieces together and to make sure that everyone understands and everyone who is, is part of it, the Coast Guard, the, the Army Corps of Engineers. And it's just like you were saying earlier, Sam, yeah. about you know the misinformation and, and just to be quite honest, you know, pure ignorance that we have seen on uh, on the internet. One of the things that I have found particularly fascinating is that I've learned more about the kind of jobs that people are doing to get this right. Women that are participating, women that are leading mm -hmm. this, and, and because I was watching just earlier this week, and I was like, so you are, you know, one of the women was a, was a a chief engineer and her title was was half a page long and I and I was just thinking to myself my goodness how on earth did you get into that and that and that just kind of makes you know this is the subset of it all of a sudden hey there's something else you can do kid exactly. <laughs> you know exactly. um, that that is that is worthwhile so I think there are all kinds of of uh, of sidebar stories, subplots to to this horrific event that will continue to 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 continue to pan out. Uh, let us talk about Donald Trump and the hush money trial. Mm -mm -mm. There have been seven jurors that have been seated already on Monday. More than ninety potential jurors were excused. Uh, at least half of them said they could 
not uh, serve because they they did not think that they they didn't believe that they could be impartial. And we heard on Monday from this particular uh, juror who was excused, and this is what she had to say. Such an interesting experience because it's I had never seen him in person before, you know, um, and you you see someone blown up so larger than life on the media for so many years. Um, to see them in person is very jarring. Sam, she said that she believes that she was dismissed because the jury duty would not fit with you know, with her job. But I, I found that young lady to be particularly interesting, uh, articulate, being able to, to, to talk, as we just heard, colorfully about her own um, impressions. And we don't necessarily know which way she may have been leaning, but she did say that she believed that she could be objective. She sounded like she was enamored with Donald, with Donald Trump a little bit. I think she was enamored with the process. I mean, regardless, you know, Donald Trump, to some extent, people might describe him as a larger than light figure. And, you know, I think to some degree, that's what got him into the White House in the first place. Our oh, infatuation yeah. with power, celebrity, with money, celebrity. Exactly. And with all of the talk among, you know, black people about Donald Trump, if you look back in the rappers catalogs throughout the 90s and the 2000s, Donald Trump was a figure that was mentioned time and time again, you know, positively as like that guy who had money. A few rappers emulated Donald Trump, you know, not to say that it was legitimate, but it just speaks to image. what we're up, yeah, image, yeah. what we're up against, you know, in this trial, like like just just the audacity of this guy, you know, paying off women and, you know, waving his hand at the law and, you know, all of that will come to a head. But the jury selection process more than anything shows you know, again, the psychology of the jurors, you know, what what are our thoughts about power, about money, about about the so-called American dream? You know, yeah. I find this whole process, even the jury selection to be really, really interesting. Yeah. And but seven already. That's um, it's moving along. Yeah. Well, first, let me stipulate that this is all very ghetto and I do not mean that <laughs> in the way that People like to associate ghetto with black. I think that if you looked up ghetto in the picture, Donald J. Trump would be right there. This is a person who has been impeached twice, oh, no, yeah. who has is facing 50, 90 felony charges across three jurisdictions. We're talking about two different states. He's had, he has felony trial. Uh, he has felony charges that he's facing, going to trial soon. He has federal charges in multiple federal cases. This is the epitome of ghetto, okay? Not with a, black, a hard T. With a hard T. Not a black woman wearing a bonnet at the grocery store. It is <laughs> Donald Trump, the former twice impeached, 91, 91 times indicted president of the United ex president of the United States, who was on trial during a campaign se season, who beat out a dozen other Republicans, who were all equally as crazy, by the way, just without the indictments. And so I, I have to start with that. Uh, but what I think is extraordinary is the pace that this trial is proceeding, which is probably why he was doing everything he could to try to get it delayed, because this is a really slam dunk case. This is a lot of documents that are going to determine um, his guilt. It's not just a matter of perception. Um, Michael Cohen has already been convicted and served time. Well, I think he actually pled, uh, but he served jail time for these charges. Same thing. Yes, for the exact same thing. Same thing. Um, and so we've seen even, I'm, I'm throwing it back, you know, you have Paul Manafort and others who were convicted in the Trump orbit of document financial crimes. And so this is probably the worst case scenario for him. Um, having a judge that is so efficient, this isn't like the Young Thug trial where it took them a year to see the jury. We're talking about, with this high profile, an astronomical pace where they might even be ready to proceed with the actual trial um, next week. And so Donald Trump should be shaking in his boots right now. He's trying to lash out on social media. The judge is not having it. Um, District Attorney Alvin Bragg is on his case trying to get this contempt in there and try to really reel this process in and make it less of a circus and more of a, an official proceeding that I believe, based on the track record, 
of Donald Trump losing every case he's had civilly, he's in real legal jeopardy here. And I, I think one of the other, the, the juice, I, I, I'm here for the juice. Mm -hmm. The the Stormy Daniels testimony, right? Michael Cohen, the the other uh, Playboy model mm -hmm. that Karen McDougal, Karen McDougal, that is that it is alleged that uh, he also it paid off. Um, you can say what you want about you know, Michael Cohen, but I think these two women are very very credible, mm -hmm. and and I think that's one of the things that's definitely going to be problematic for him because we already know how he feels about his money. Yeah. And in signing checks that that were going uh, to to these women, not to mention his relationship with the National Enquirer, the the so-called catch and kill story. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think that is going to be I think it's going to be problematic for him Sam. Without question, and you know, just like Reese laid out eloquently, uh, there's nowhere to hide for Donald Trump at all, and it really, you know, once again, calls into question people who are voting for him or people who are thinking about voting for him. What what does that say about them, knowing that right before our very eyes, this is playing out on national TV, this man being um, broken down, you know, indictment by indictment. Um, It'll be very, very interesting to watch. And again, you know, just given what we've seen over the last four years or so, um, I, for one, am looking forward to seeing it wrap up. Whether it'll wrap up soon, it's yet to be seen, but I, I, I'm really ready to move on from Donald Trump. Let me move on to two other stories before we run out of time. Uh, the first one, uh, Dr. Frederick Haynes has resigned as president and CEO of the Rainbow Push Coalition. Three months after taking the job, as we know, uh, founder, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, uh, stepped down after heading this, this organization for, for many, many decades because of, of Parkinson's disease. I, I'll start with you, Reese. What do we know about this three months? That's a short tenure. Very short. Is that even a tenure? <laughs> well, tenure might be a strong word. Yeah. Short stint. <laughs> Trial yeah. period. There we go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And, and, and we, he's been vague mm -hmm. as to why he's done this. But I think that the bigger issue is there have been other organizations, national civil rights organizations, that when they've made transitions, these things have been difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, the... The Urban League, for example, uh, has been uh, pretty stable yeah. with Mark Morial. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about you know, the NAACP, the uh, United Negro College Fund, and now this, do we have a problem with making, with the peaceful transfer of power, <laughs> Sam? <laughs> I, we definitely do, without question. and. I'm not going to be that guy to place blame on the civil rights generation, but at the very same time, at least when it comes to our people, we look at the civil rights era as that beacon, that period, and then after that, you know, all is well, when in fact, all has not been well. And I think that the transition or lack of transition speaks to that, you know, just seeing that long after the 60s and the 70s, there's still this schism between the elders and the young people. And within any community you go into, there, there, there's, just a, there's just a vast inability for us to transfer knowledge or to transfer appreciation for sacrifices made during that period of time into the young people. And, you know, if you look across the board, young people have interests that are different from their elders or they have a different outlook. You know, this election is an example of that. And in speaking of um, Reverend Haynes's resignation, I'm not one to speculate, but you know, given what I know about him and about the liberation theology that he preaches, I get a sense that, that there might have been some philosophical differences that he had encountered within those three months. That um, you know, with the civil rights legacy of the Rainbow Push Coalition, there might have been a clash as to how to make that work in this day and age where you see the civil rights generation 
um, sort of exiting and you see a new generation of young people, you know, despite the fact that he's not young, but you see young people really not connecting with that and sort of questioning old institutions, you know. So a lot to think about, but just to wrap it up, there is that schism between the old and the new and and our inability to transfer knowledge and to preserve institutions. We really got to practice that as black people. Real quick, uh, Atlantic City Mayor Marty Small and his wife Laquita Small have been accused of emotionally and, and physically abusing their 16-year-old daughter. This issue is, is centered on her relationship with a young man and the parents don't like it. Yeah. And she's 16, you're under our roof. Now, she, according to court documents, she's been hit upside the head with the broom, mama punched her in the chest, daddy said, I'll slap the leave off your head. Um, is this about corporal punishment? Man. I mean, I know you were a good girl, so I guess I'll just have to. That's what you're well, but. yeah, I, I was, and I have a daughter, and I would absolutely not do that to and her. And when she's three. Yeah, and then when she's 16, then I would hope that I would have built up the credibility and the, the, the relationship, patience, mm -hmm. uh, always. Um, you know, listen. I can understand being protective, mm -hmm. but being abusive is not being protective. So you have to find a way to 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 balance that. Even if you have a hard-headed child, okay, or mm -hmm. a hard-headed teenager, you have to find a way to control yourself. And the way that you get through to them, I don't think in this day and age. Maybe back in the day, you can just go upside the head. But in this day and age, you have to find another way. Yeah. Real quick, your thoughts about that, Sam? Before we get to what you guys are working on. No, no doubt. I think a hard-headed teenager. That was boiling for years to come. I, I'm, I'm not a parent at all. I'm an uncle. I got nieces and nephews, and, and I've seen things happen over time. They say by the age of seven, a lot of what you put into a child is already there. So, you know, whatever she, and not to speculate again, yeah. but, you know, of course, you know, to my uh, sister's point here, you can't whoop a child and expect them to change. A lot that you want to put in them, you put in them over time. So if she's doing whatever she's doing, it's because you might not set the standards over time like you should have. I still feel the fat lip that both of my parents gave me when I caught up. Um, what are you working on this week, Reese? Well, I have a card game, Am I Tripping Game. It's available for sale. And always my show, Sirius XM, The Reese Colbert Show on Saturdays. Okay, what are you working on, Sam, this week? Uh, I just interviewed Dr. Melina uh, Abdullah. Uh, the running mate for Dr. Cornell West on the mm. independent ticket, so expect something out about that. And I'm also working on local DC politics on the Ward 8 council election in particular. That is going to be fascinating. This isn't bid whist, is it? Not spades, no, it's okay. no, a conversation card. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. man. <laughs> oh, why, well, Sam, PK Collins, Rizzi Cobra, thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys coming in and, and adding to this conversation. That is the Daily Drum for this Wednesday. April 17th, I'm Harold Fisher. Good night. This program was produced by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at whut.org.